Carnegie Mellon University's advanced database systems course is filmed in front of a live studio audience. It's two o'clock now, but we covered Bristol scale, we covered diarrhea, we covered uh, what else? Be behavioral interviews. Okay, let's, let's talk about databases. All right, so today we're going to talk about uh, now how do we take the query plans that we've been given uh, and actually start running them on, on, on our system. So recall that the last couple of lectures we've had were focusing on um, how to actually optimize the, or build an optimized execution engine so that we can run sequential scan queries as fast as possible. And again, the, 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 the major two camps are going to be the vectorization people with using SIMD and then the query compilation stuff that we talked about last class. In the case of query compilation, there was two high-level approaches. There was transpilation or source-to-source -source compilation. That's like you have your C++ code, emit C++ code, that then gets compiled. And then the alternative was from the hyper paper that you guys read was JIT comp compilation by generating like a low-level IR for the actual instructions you want to execute for that query plan and then using something like ASM JIT or LLVM to, to compile it. And again, as I said, the main takeaway that from, from you know, at least from the, since the seminal papers on vectorization and co compilation have come out over the last decade is that most of the systems that we're going we're to read about uh, in the, near the end of the semester are going to choose vectorization with SIMD. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, it's a combination of auto-vectorization and, and with intrinsics. But they're going to choose that over compilation just because the engineering overhead to maintain, to be able to maintain a JIT compiled database engine is super high. You, we'll read this in the Photon paper from Databricks. They explicitly call out, it's better off having a bunch of people try to optimize the SIMD stuff, because then you can reach parity to the, uh, the compilation, uh, compilation implementation, um, versus like if you go down the JIT path, there's a small number of people that, that actually can work on it. All right. All right, so again, today we're talking about scheduling, of how do you take a query plan and divide it up amongst the different, different workers in our system. And so, again, just make sure that we're using the right, the right terminology. We're going to say that a query plan is going to be a DAG of operators and then, you know, relational operators, and then the operator instance is going to be an invocation of that operator on some portion of, of our, the data that we're trying to scan. So we're trying to read a table. You know, if it's, if it's broken up into row groups, we would have an operator instance be responsible for scanning uh, a single row group and, and processing that. And then a task is going to be some computational piece of work that's going to attain contain multiple operator instances, typically in the, in the same pipeline, that we want to then hand out to our, our workers to execute. And then a, collect, a task set, sometimes called, called a resource set uh, in some of the papers, this is going to be the, the collection of the tasks that we need, or the collection of the tasks that we have for a given query that we need to execute. And the idea is that we know where the pipeline breakers are because we're the data system, we're the one building the query plan. So the idea is to convert these pipelines into individual tasks that we can then farm out and execute. And so, the, so today's class is really discussing figuring out how do we assign these, these tasks to workers in our system. So I'm loosely defined, you know, using the work, term worker generically, but you can think of it almost as either a core or a thread or a process. Right? It doesn't matter. Or a node. And then keeping track of like where, where the data they need to access is coming from and where is any intermediate results that they're generating, where is that going to go? So this is basically repeating what I said. The, the idea of, of the scheduler in our system is that we want to know, for a given query, how many tasks should we use, right? Because we want to take advantage of all the parallel uh, cores that we have available to us, also the parallel operations within SIMD, or that's usually a below than what we're actually going to schedule for. Um, but keeping track of how many tasks we want to use, how many CPU cores we want to farm them, farm them, farm them out, out on, uh, and then when a task generates some kind of output that either you know, if it needs to go to, the, to a next task, where should we actually store that? Because right? in some cases, if it's stored at local to us, it may be the task that's going to read it may be, may, be, may be remote. So it might be better to push the data to where the next task is going to need it. But you might not know when, what that task is going to be. So, We'll see this as we go along, but the paper I had you guys read from, from, from Hyper, uh, it's about single node execution. And we'll, we'll see how we tie this all later at the end, end of the class, but the, the three different implementations of a schedule we're going to look at, they're all also going to be all single node, node systems. And so the reason why I'm focusing on this rather than a distributed system is because 
basically the problem is the same. It doesn't matter whether it's a single node or multi-threaded or, or, or multiple nodes that are each single threaded. Like, it really is the high level problem we're trying to solve is what tasks we want to run where and where should, the, where should the output results go. And the main takeaway is going to be that we're always going to want to do this ourselves, especially on a single node and not the operating system. Right? I think in the, in the hyper paper you guys read, I think they distinguish it between Postgres. Postgres is just letting the OS do all the scheduling because it's just you know, uh, forking full processes. Right? Uh, and I don't think they even play games with like, you know, process priority and so forth. But, and so instead, with the exception of Postgres, every data system is going to want to do all the scheduling stuff itself. So we can, we can talk about how to do it on a single node, and then we, you know, you'll see how that maps to a distributed environment. Well, there'll be some things we can do in a distributed environment that we're not going to cover today, but we'll see this later on. Like in, in BigQuery or Dremel, they're going to do shuffle, they're going to do have a shuffle stage after every pipeline breaker, right? And that allows them to reorganize and recalibrate the workers uh, later on. But again, we'll cover that later. All right, so what are our goals for, for building a high-performance schedule for a data system? So obviously, we want to maximize throughput. We want to be able to, to process as many queries as possible. Uh, in, in our system, you know, just sort of keep the thing always running and always consuming of results and producing, producing output. We're going to maintain some notion of, of fairness. Uh, and again, this is, this is subjective of what fairness means to sort of one query to another query. But at a high level is that, you know, at the end of the day, we need to make sure that no query gets starved for resources. So even though we may delay the priority, and we'll talk about what, what that means, why we want to do that as we go along, but we want to, even if you get a lower priority, your long-running query, at the end of the day, we still want, still want you to complete. And then the flip side of this is that we want to make sure that the system seems to be re responsive. That, that, that's reducing the tail latency, like the P99 latency of, of queries, if, if we can. But this will matter a lot for short queries. Um, and so the idea here is that we want our short queries to complete as fast as possible because that's something someone's going to notice. Right, at, the, at the shortest scales of, of query execution, like if your query goes from you know, 100 milliseconds to, to 1,000 milliseconds, then you would notice that. Right? So you want to get these short queries out as quickly as possible. But if you're like, your query is running for 10 minutes and it takes 20 seconds longer, no one's going to notice that. So the system's going to appear more responsible if you can get the shorter queries out more quickly. Um, in the case of the, the morsel stuff, they, they don't have a specific way to actually to handle that. Um, they're sort of treating everyone roughly. They had a QoS thing that they were suggesting they might do in, like it, in, the, sub, in the subsequent paper. In, in, the, in the Umbra one? It, it was in the hyper paper, the one that we did. There was something in the, uh, in the conclusion. In the that, 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 I'm saying they, they would like to do it. Yeah. I, I don't know why they did it in hyper. Oh. They do it in Umbra. We'll cover that in a second. Um, yeah, but, so I mean, but the Morsels one is, again, that sets the foundation for this idea of how to divide up the work. And they're going to do static assignment of tasks to Morsels, and we'll see in Umbra how they, they can break that. In the Umbra one is more sophisticated. And the last one, of course, is that we want <laughs> our scheduler to have low overhead. Like, it doesn't help us if we're running this super complex computation to figure out the, idea, the, optimal, scheduling, uh, the optimal schedule for all our tasks. If that takes 20 minutes, and a query can you know, finish up in a few milliseconds. So we want to have most of our, our system spending time uh, you know, co computing queries, because that's what people, at you the know, end of the day, really care about. So I'm going to just talk about some quick background in the beginning. Again, this will be a uh, quick reminder of the things we talked about in the intro class. But first, talk about like, what is actually a worker? Or like, how, how are we defining the scope of, of, the, of a computational unit? Where, where is it actually located in our system? We'll briefly talk about what data placement actually means in the context of partitioning. And that basically is just, if I've already divided the data up in some way, where should I put that data? And the two, two are linked together, but again, we'll discuss that. And then that's one of the things that the Morsels paper spent a lot of time talking about was this notion between uh, you know, local memory and remote memory in a NUMA architecture. And they were trying to schedule things so that uh, you were always processing stuff that was local to you. Again, the same idea applies in, in a distributed system. Ideally, we want our, our workers, if they're on, on a node, processing data that's local to it rather than having to go over the network you know, to, to some far storage. And then we'll talk about three implications of schedulers. We'll talk about the, the morsels from Hyper. We'll talk about the follow-up in Umbra. And then we'll talk about an alternative from the SAP HANA guys. Um, and then we'll finish off again just putting in the context of, of a distributed architecture.
Okay? And so the, the, what will be interesting about the, the we're talking about schedule implementations, we'll see in Umbra and Hyper, these are, these are going to have like sort of dedicated worker pools that are just like uh, crunching through all the tasks as they can, whereas uh, in the HANA one, they're trying to be a bit more, more sophisticated and have this notion of some worker threads can, can be asleep, some worker threads can be parked. Uh, and we'll also see this trade-off between work stealing and not work stealing, which is another dynamic we have to consider as well. All right, so, and this is just a reminder of, of from the intro class that there's, a, there's this notion of a process model in any database management system, and this specifies what the, uh, what a worker actually is going to be in our, in, in, our, in our system, right? So the, the sort of the earlier data, early database systems in the 1980s, early 1990s, these were a process-based system, meaning like every worker was a separate OS process, because back then they didn't have uh, P threads like we have now that you know that weren't really portable. So if you wanted to support one Unix versus another Unix, you had basically had you know the, the POSIX API specified how to do fork to spawn processes, but maybe not uh, could, didn't have threading. Every modern system now today is going to be multi-threaded. So we'll assume in our, in our system we're conceptually building that it'll be multi-threaded. The only ones that are not multi-threaded are ones that fork Postgres because Postgres is a, is a, uses a process per worker. And the worker is going to be this generic term that means it's just the computational resource that can be assigned a task uh, to execute you know, for some query or some, something, for the internal data, something for the database system. And that it can take some data in, crunch on it uh, in our operator instances, and then produce output. And as I said, for, for our purposes going forward, you can assume every system, unless they fork Postgres, is going to be uh, multi-threaded. For some reason, in the, in the early days when I first started at CMU, we took Postgres and we decided to uh, make it multi-threaded instead of multi-process. Um, I forget why we did that. Uh, but the interesting thing about it is, if you ever look at the Postgres code, there's a bunch of pound of fines for the different, CPU, for different OSs they support, like Linux and Windows and HPOX and BSD. And we, we ended up going and using like the Win32 uh, code. And that was, that was at least a starting point for us to be, then convert everything to pthreads. We also converted it to C++11, which I don't know why we did that one either. Um, I, yeah, we did it. We shouldn't have done it, but whatever. Yes? So you said Postgres is single-threaded, but I thought you also said it has processes. And so Postgres, Postgres is it's a process per worker. So okay. the, the, a worker is going to be a, a, a whole entire OS process. So you can do some parallel execution of queries, but that's going to be across multiple processes, and they use shared memory to communicate. But no, like, you wouldn't build a system like that today. But yes? If all modern systems are multi-threaded, why is it a bad idea to do that with Postgres? Uh, this question is, if, if, all, if all modern systems are multi-threaded, why, why was it a bad idea for us to try to do that in Postgres? Yeah. Uh, looking back on it now, I fail to see what the, what the, the research, uh, research contribution would have been. Right, we well, we, so we had this execution engine that was written in C++ that was faster than Postgres, which is not hard, always hard to do, or not sorry, not that hard to do. And then rather than sliding it in as an extension using extension hooks that Postgres supports, which is what Timescale does and Citus does, uh, CFAL is another one. There's a bunch of these data systems that use extension hooks to get OLAP engines inside of Postgres. We decided to like fork everything, and then we. The top half of Postgres, we had the top half, kept the top half, rewrote the bottom half, and we decided to then just scrap the whole top and rewrite everything, because everything was sort of slow for what we wanted to do. But again, if I had to do it all again, I, I would have just used extensions. Yes? So does, does a process model like the term, is that, is that just like multi-threaded versus process per thread? So like single process and it also covers like, like numerous columns to be separate across? Its question is, does the process model determine the any of the, the, the new topology stuff is just like, is it a thread per worker? Is it a process per worker? It's just a process per worker. Like, it's, it's just like, like is it a, what is the, is it a thread? Is it a process? Is it a process pool per worker? The NUMA stuff is, is ancillary. Okay. So the other thing we, we can account for is how do we want to assign the workers to CPU cores? Um, and the, the basic two approaches are you could have a single dedicated thread or single dedicated worker be, be the only thing that can run on, on a single core, a single CPU core. Uh, and this prevents like 
um, this prevents contention on that core where like two threads are trying to run at the same time, the worker's trying to run at the same time at the same core, and they're trashing each other's you know, L3 caches and so forth. Yes? So one worker is working on one task or one entire task set or one partition of the task set? His question is, is one worker going to be working on, on one task? Or one task set or one a partition of the task set? We're not there yet, okay. right? But you, it, it's going to be one task. One task. Yes. And again, and then think of that like I have to scan this table. The table has like 10 chunks or morsels. You have one worker for each of those, those 10 morsels. Right. Uh, the other one is going to be uh, you're going to have multiple workers on, on per CPU core. And the idea here is that with when one one core gets or thread gets stalled because a one worker thread gets stalled because the thing it needs is on is out on disk and it'll fetch into memory or even if there's like a low level L3 cache miss, right? You could have other threads run at the same time. For maximum performance, this is probably the the, the right way to go though, right? And actually, in, if it's have, you also want to turn off, turn off hyper threading and just run you know bare metal hardware threads, right? Because the because we're we're going to be CPU bound and most of the computations we're going to do in our database system. We don't want any contention on, on the actual hardware itself. All right. There's other advantages in this uh, for if you do like transaction processing, where thing you can't just you don't want any stalls. But for OLAP, uh, like for, for both OLAP and OTP, this, this could be the better way to go. The Hana guys are going to claim this is better because they're going to have really they're going to try to do fine grained control of what threads are actually awake and running at a given time. Um, but again, we'll. We'll, we'll cover that later. And they claim that's going to be better for a machine with a lot, lot, lot of cores. I'm oh, sorry, a lot of sockets. Yes? You're saying approach one is better? Yes. But why wouldn't you want your cores to be utilized? So if, if you're compute bound and you're careful about what, what you're putting in your CPU caches and you're prefetching things ahead of time, a core should never be stalled. Right? Again, we saw this with the branchless stuff. Like if you, if you, if you design the, the, the system in such a way that like, do you avoid branch mispredictions and, and having to flush the pipeline of the CPU, then you should just be crunching through data as fast as possible. And you should never have it stalls or branch misses. Yes? Is this per CPU core or per hardware thread? Uh, per core, but within that, you turn off hyper threading so it's one hardware thread. Okay. So, like a socket can have four cores, and each core can have two threads because of hyper threading, right? So you turn off hyperthreading, and now it's one core equals one hardware thread. So turn off hyperthreading because of, because of avoiding contention is more valuable. Yes. Okay. You're running basically bare metal. Why, why, wait, why turn off hyperthreading on the whole system? Like, wouldn't you be able to then like run little like you have a cron job running or something? Couldn't you have that run on the, on what, the logical thread? What is that cron job? What is this for? I don't know. Like you have a server running, right? You have a database on the server. Yes. The database is dominating the CPU. Yes. Right. You can have that. It can handle all of the all of the. It, it can sort of own all of the actual real threads that correspond to real cores, and maybe then the background paths in the system can run on the unutilized parts of the cores. What are these back, like like garbage collection and stats collection, or what, what, what are these background tasks? Like not even prior to CV runs, just the Oh, ra stuff. randoms, like random stuff? Yeah, yeah. Why would you run them in your database server? Well, I mean, presumably it's running on an OS, right? Yes. You're doing something. Yeah. So, well, Turn all that off. You don't want any of that. No, no. Is there an advantage of turning it off? Yeah. Yeah, you, you, don't have, you don't have two threads contending for the same hardware resource. Yeah. Uh, I, I do have a graph. Um, I, my impression was that uh, when you have hyper threading on, the, the other logical thread that spawns at the same core, it's going to only use the unutilized part of the core. No. What, 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 what is the unutilized part of the core? You, you, have, you have a pi pipeline of instructions, right? So when one gets stalled, the idea is like you, you swap out all the registers for this other logical thread, the hyper thread, and then they come in and, and pick up where you left off, right? See. But like, again, it, like if you're, if you're CPU bound, it, it, there's, there's, no, there's not going to be stalls like that. Yes? So we don't want contention, just to summarize, right? we don't want contention because when we have two threads, uh, if, we ha if we have hyper threading, then we end up, it's because they're fighting for the same hardware, we, there'll be more cache misses or something at, at the other one level? Or is yes. Yeah. Is, like, same, same it is, uh, if there's more contention, if there's more things running on a single core, right, right saying with two hyper threads, 
then they're both trying to do something, some amount of work, and they want things that need to bring things in the L3 cache, right? right? Or the, the bring in your caches, and that's going to pollute it. And then, whereas it would have been better off just letting one thread run to, you know, to completion. Yes. For your desktop, sure, because like you're browsing the web, listening to music, watching videos. Oh, there's a ton of stalls of that. Who cares, right? right. But for the database system, you're not running random like you know Bitcoin mining on it. Like you, it's no cron jobs. If you care about you know if you really care about your database system, right? If it's a blog, and you're running like MySQL, Postgres just to service the blog. No, who cares? Sure. But if it's like a high-end database system, like you're not letting anybody just SSH into it and run random stuff, right? Uh, so, right, so this is a this, this is an older experiment that students did uh, here at CMU, where it was just a sort of toy in-memory engine, um, and it's it's distinguishing between uh, letting the database system decide where to actually place data in a NUMA, NUMA architecture. Does anyone know what NUMA is? Who doesn't know what NUMA is? Perfect. Excellent. Yeah. So the, so the idea is like, do you let the data system figure out, okay, this piece of data is going to go at this core at this location or this NUMA region, or you let the OS figure it out for you? And so what you see here is that before you get to the, to the hyperthreading line, right, you're going to get better scalable performance, better performance uh, when you, the data system controls exactly what, what, you know, where the data is relocated, because now it has data that's local to it. You don't have to go over the, the interconnect, which in some cases can be 2x latency. Right? So that's why this thing is going to apply to it. Now, to your point, why not leave hyperthreading on? This is when hyperthreading kicks in. Right? And now you see complete, complete flat lines because for, for either one because they're not, it's CPU, CPU bound computation. Right? And in the cases when it has to go to, to memory to go fetch something to fill, fill its caches, well, if I'm running another hyperthread, it's going to do the exact same thing and now it's, you know, I'm not getting any benefit. So here I'm throwing, I'm throwing more threads at it but performance is, is, is plateaued. Yes? At some point, you'll fetch from memory, right? I mean, there will be some unused. I mean, all of these are, right? Like, all of these are fetching from memory. But, like, if, if I'm stalled, like, fetching from memory is so expensive. If I'm fetching from memory and I'm waiting for that, then you start running. Well, what are you going to do? Fetch from memory. So you're doing the exact same thing I am. So and, and now, now you're blocked on the, the bandwidth of getting things from the DIMMs to the, to the CPU. Plus you're polluting your cache. Furthermore, you might, I, I mean, this is, talk to, talk to the architecture people, but now you're like, I don't know how well the hardware prefetching is going to be because now like, I would have been better off having one thread rip through a larger chunk of data versus having two threads start different spots and, and try to prefetch those. Again, I think the hardware prefetching stuff could probably handle that. But it's just making things more complicated. Whereas if you keep the system more simple, you know, we, we can get better utilization of what we have. OK, so hyperthreading, nice in general, but not for databases. OK, so we were. All right, so the next thing we've got to consider is uh, how are we actually going to get our tasks to our workers? And there's basically two approaches, either push versus a pool. And in the, in the, the push approach, there's some kind of centralized dispatch or scheduler component that has a global view or, or a, a, a view of what the workers that, it's in, that's in, that are under its purview or administrative control. It knows what tasks they're, they're doing. And then as, as new tasks arrive, it's pushing the, those, those requests, those task uh, requests to the different, different workers to, get, to always give them something to do. Right? And then when the, the worker notifies the bachelor is finished, uh, you know, it's immediately going to be given, hey, here, here's the next thing to do. The pool-based approach, which is going to be the better approach, which everyone's going to do, is going to be that the, the sum scheduler component that's maintaining the, the queue of all possible tasks that could be executed at any, any given time, with additional metadata of maybe about what data they're trying to access and where is that located. And then now the workers, when, when they need something to do, they, they come to this, this, this queue and get, get the next thing to do, right? And this is just easier because it, it's, uh, it's less coordination of like, or maintaining state about you know, where, where each worker is, is in, you know, in its computation. It just says, hey, here's a bunch of stuff to do. Here's my, you know, it's a la carte. And people can just come, come and pull things off the buffet tray uh, when they're ready for it. Yes? Which one has lower overhead? Question is, which one has lower overhead for what? Uh, 
we don't want the scheduling to take too much time, right? And so uh, naturally, if you if you are a worker who has to go pull from the queue, that probably is you're eating up CPU cycles in doing that. So That's yeah. So his statement is, um, and there's there actually two parts of it. His statement is. Uh, the question is, which one has lower overhead? If it's the pool-based approach, then now you have every worker thread going to say, what should I be doing next on their own? Right. Uh, and won't that incur a penalty for you know, when they could be running queries? Right. Sure, yes. In some ways, and there's, the second aspect also too is like this queue thing, which we'll see in the hyper paper, is a global data structure, which now you have to protect with latches or locks. That too, yeah. And then now everybody could be, could be potentially contended on that. So. Everyone's still going to choose this just because it's you can build this this schedule as a separate service and not worry about exact control or exact knowledge of what every single worker is actually doing because the worker may die, right? And then now you got to figure out like you know uh, did I told a bunch of do a bunch of stuff ahead of time and and, and now I can't do it where you just say here's everything I need to do and then now each worker thread to then figure out on their own what's the best thing for them to do. They're all sort of work, working globally to, to solve the problem. Also, it's less intelligent, isn't it? Like, the the pull-based approach. Yeah. Uh, you can make the he, say, he, say, he says that it's less intelligent, but like relative to what? To like, this? To that, because you can have priorities in the push one. You can have the priorities in the pull one. Just because hyper doesn't, doesn't mean you can't. We'll see it in a second. You, you mentioned like with, with the push-based approach, like workers dying becomes an issue. How is it also not an issue with the pull-based yeah, he's right. He's, if, if, if a push-based approach have workers die, you've got to figure it out. Actually, that'd be approach two, not approach one. Um, <laughs> the, you still have to deal with that in the pool one. Yes, you're right, because you basically need a heartbeat to figure out who or they didn't come back. Um, another way to think about it in the pool-based approach is that you can have the logic to figure out what, 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 work, what, what task the worker needs to execute itself uh, next. Is, is basically that logic is being distributed across multiple workers. Whereas like if it's a single centralized service, then it's one beefy box or whatever that has to then figure this out. Um, I'd probably say that's the main distinction. Yes? In the pull-based approach, does the scheduler say to keep track of about how long each task would take? Her question is, uh, in the pull-based approach, does the scheduler need to keep track of how long each task is going to take? Yes. Hyper, Hyper doesn't do that. We'll see this in Umbra. The question is, can you, can you use the same cost model as, as, as the query optimizer? Um, so the challenge there is, is that some cost models in, in some systems, can, you can't map whatever the, 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 the cost estimate to like a wall clock time. Mm -hmm. If you ever looked at Postgres, it'll be like, it's, it's some number. It's some amount, and it's a combination of like, is it a sequential scan, random scan, how much data they're going to read, and so forth. Right? So, so, I don't, maybe people have tried this, but it's, I don't think anybody, you can't just take that number, oh, it's 10 milliseconds or something like that. Now, the high-end enterprise data systems do try to give you cost estimates to say, you know, here's the, here's the relative cost of the query, which is an eternal value that you can use to compare different query plans, but inside the same system. But they also can then spit out, I think it's going to take this amount of time. So you could do that. Um, but again, we'll see this in a few weeks, cost models are always widely off. So in the Umbra, which I keep, Number, the number scheduling paper, which I keep uh, alluding to, they're actually going to watch what, how long a task takes, and then use that to figure out, uh, you know, to get a rough estimate of like what the scheduling time should be for certain things. Okay. All right. So, regardless of how we're going to allocate workers or tasks to, to our, to, the, to you know, our resources and our system, uh, as we said already that it's important to make sure that the, the data they're going to process ideally is going to be local to, to whatever that worker is, right? And in the case of the, the, the hyper paper, it's an in-memory database, so local means it's in the same NUMA region. Obviously, in a distributed system, uh, especially within a shared disk architecture, well, the cost of going get data from S3 could be basically the same for every single worker node, assuming you're in the same data center in the, in the same region. But once we start caching things, which we'll see uh, later in the semester, like every, no every compute node could have its own local copy of, of you know, files read from S3. Uh, and then now when I, wanna, when I assign tasks, I want to make sure that the task is assigned to the node that's going to have a local copy of, of that data. Yes? This is, uh, this is also another reason why probably 
slightly dumber because it doesn't know what, what if it just looks at a global queue and it's like, ah, give me the next task. Right? Yes. That it's not necessarily that the data that it, that's needed for that next task is there on its local store. His David is the pool seems dumber because if the worker is trying to you know, maximize the locality of the data it needs to access, it can't do that in a pool-based approach. Why not? Because it's just popping the top one from the queue. You, you no, know, you don't have to pop from the top. Well, the hyper does it one way, we'll see this in other ways, in other systems, right? I mean, you have a priority queue. You don't, you, don't, you don't always have to pop from the top. Now, if you're doing work stealing, you, uh, you may recognize that the, the thing at the head of the queue is not local to you, but you may want to go ahead and, and, and run it anyway because you're available. Hyper does that. Uh, I don't think Umber does, and HANA doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yes. Okay. So, it's not, so it's a global queue in that, uh, in that everyone can see it and manipulate it, but it, it's not going to guarantee FIFO ordering of, of, of the, the elements of the queue. Okay. Right? So it's a priority queue. Sure. In hyper, it's a hash table, right? right, right, right. Okay. So again, I've, I've already said this. Like you could have some data systems will have locally attached storage. Uh, as a cache, like again, think of like you spin up an EC2 node, you can get ones with NVMe drives that are local to it that are really, really fast. And so you'd use that as a local cache. It's ephemeral, so if the node crashes, you don't need to retain anything in there. Uh, but again, while it's available, you could use that instead of having to go to, to S3. In some systems, again, Snowflake is probably the, uh, the most aggressive on this, because um, again, they don't want to pay Amazon S3 costs. They can also use other nodes as a nearby cache. So if you know this other node is responsible for the data and you're running the task, instead of going to S3, uh, you could go directly to, to that node and get it. But they're actually not going to do that because they don't want to interfere with the, the, the other node because it might be going slow. Right? If, you know, if, it, if you're stealing work that was meant for this other node, it's probably because they're slow. So why go start making requests to them to make them even slower? It's sort of the logic there. And then the, the NUMA versus not uh, uniform memory access stuff we've already talked about, like local versus remote memory. Um, oops, sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Partitioning and placement. So the, in the, the intro class, we talked about partitioning, this idea of how do you take a, a data set and pick some set of columns or some keys and then divide it up based, based on the values of those keys across different, different files, right? And that would allow you to, to spread out the data uh, evenly, ideally, across resources so that when a query run, or query arrives that can run in parallel, each worker can have the same amount of work uh, so they're all sort of processing things uniformly. So there's going to be some policy you're going to use to say, here's how I want to split things up, hash partitioning, round robin, range partitioning, and so forth. Um, and then there'll be some target objective you're trying to have for, for deciding how I want, the reason why I want to partition things a certain way. So one thing could be, I want, I want to reduce the amount of uh, network traffic when I do a join, so maybe, maybe I, I want to partition my, partition my tables on the things, that are, the join keys, so that the joins can always be computed locally rather than have to do a shuffle or a broadcast join. In our world, uh, in the shared disk, you know, lake house environment, we're typically going to be doing round robin based on files because we're not the ones generating these files, right? Someone loaded a bunch of stuff in S3, a bunch of Parquet org files. We're not going to have time to go fix them up and put them, you know, partition them and rebalance them according to, again, some, some target objective. Snowflake will do this. They call it micro partitions, but I think they only do it for their internal data format. Meaning, like, if you, if you do insert queries to put data into Snowflake, then they can rebalance stuff uh, later on, or repartition it later on. But if, again, if it's a bunch of files in S3, you can't rewrite them. Yes? In addition to the number of values, you're saying that, like, because we have a bunch of these, like, partition files, that they're just picking them based off, like, the quantity of, like, ones in the file. So, like, so your question is for if you're doing round robin partitioning at the t at the file level, what is the data system actually doing? Yeah. It literally is like file one go to you, file two go to him, file three go to him. That's it. And then they're like assumed to be uniform size. The question is, are they assumed to be uniform size? Uh, typically, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, you can imagine degenerate cases where like I have like a bunch of one gigabyte files and I have one, one, one terabyte file, then that would screw, screw things up. And I, I don't know what they, they might break that up or, or so forth, right? Uh, I mean, the way to handle that one also too would be, 
you could assign the same file to different nodes, uh, but then you just within that file you say, okay, row group you know zero to five goes to the, this one, you know six to ten goes to that one. You could divide it up further, but I don't think they do that. So like yeah, partitioning on row groups makes more sense because like at least those are kind of like similar in size. Yes. Okay. Well, again, parquet is based on number of tuples, orcs is based on the the data size, but in the end, roughly about the same. Yes. It's like split further within a file? No, no, like, why, like if we have five files, why then file one, two, three, four, five, why is that split? Is there some advantage to it beyond just like if you? His question is if, if why do it split it based on, on the file? Uh, what, what, is there any performance advantage to it? It's easy. It's, it, yeah. you, I mean, you, you maintain less metadata. I have five files. I need five entries in my catalog to say where these files are. If I start doing subdivision uh, within that, then I have, to, I have to maintain more metadata, which some systems can do, right? Um, it, you know, if you're doing <laughs> range partitioning, yeah, you gotta keep track of where the ranges are. If it's hash partitioning, you actually don't need to do any of that. It's even cheaper. You could just say, here's the column, here's the hash key, you whatever, you know, I want to hash on, and decide where it goes. Now, if you're doing consistent hashing, which Snowflake does on the file level, then you gotta maintain the, that data structure to do consistent hashing. But that, we'll, we'll cover that later. So partitioning tells you how to split things up. The placement policy determines where those partitions are actually going to go. Uh, and again, the simplest thing to do is basically, I got five machines, they each get one file. Just round robin that. Um, you could try to be clever of you know, breaking things up in, in, in more sophisticated ways. We can ignore that. This, this is the easiest way to do it. So now in our catalog, we say, say I have these files that have uh, you know, these sizes and this information about it. Whatever, whatever I was able to glean when, when it was imported into my system, or I was, made, I was notified that it existed in S3, uh, and then I keep track of, like, this worker is responsible for it. So any, any query that shows up then has a task that wants to process that file, again, which we would determine in, in the optimizer with the catalog, the, ideally we want the worker to, that, that, that's been responsible for that, for that file to process that data. Again, whether or not that, the, that worker has a local cache or not doesn't matter. It's just we're just saying that rather than everybody read everything, we can be a bit more structured and say this, you know, this node's going to read, or this worker's going to read this, this file. All right, so far we have a task assignment model. Basically, how do we assign workers to threads or processes and so forth? Um, and whether we're going to do a push versus a pool from, from the scheduler. They have a data placement policy, again, for our purposes, on a shared disk architecture in a modern uh, lake house or, or data lake system, it's going to be at the file level and round robin di distribution. So then now we've got to say, how do we take a logical query plan and convert it to something that we can then execute? And I've sort of said this alluding as we go along, like, you know, we, we know where the pipeline breakers are. That's going to that's be the boundary for our tasks for the most part. But then now how do we take those tasks and, and run them? So if it's an OLTB query, this is super easy to do because these queries typically only have one pipeline. Do an index scan, maybe a projection, and that's it, right? There's not many operators in it, and there's no dependencies between pipelines. There's only one. So that's easy. We just, we just hand that out and let them run as fast as possible. But for OLAP queries, it's more co complicated because we know there's dependencies between these pipelines, and we can't, to avoid false negatives, we can't have one pipeline start running if the pipelines that it's dependent on haven't completed to produce whatever the intermediate results. Uh, that, that are needed. I see not, you can't always paralyze them. Yes? Why did the previous slide, slide say logical query plan instead of physical query plan? Uh, how, how did it, sorry. Like, because the, lo yeah, you could say physical, yes. Yes. If you just get rid of logical, then it's fine. Yes, yeah. that's a typo. Okay. Right, again, we, the, the logical query plan says, Scan, the, scan this, you know, I want to read this table. It doesn't tell you how to do it. Doesn't, uh, it doesn't tell you, if you, do, you know, how to do a join. It says you know, join A and B. The physical query plan is, is the actual, it's like the, the exact algorithms you want to use. So we would, we would, we, when we create a, a query plan, uh, when we convert a query plan to a bunch of tasks, we're going to be doing that on the physical operators, not the logical ones. Thank you. I will fix that. All right, so the easiest type of schedule to do, scheduling to do is called static scheduling. And this is where... The, again, the optimizer figures out 
or the scheduler figures out in the very beginning, I have this query plan, I have these workers, and I have this data, and it does a static assignment of tasks to those individual workers, right? And doesn't, you know, the simplest way to think of it is I have one task per core or per worker, and they just all run, right, at the same time. Um, you still can assign the, the workers to, or the tasks to workers that, based on the data that's local to them, but again, there's no dynamicism, there's no adapting to uh, the behavior, the performance of, of the workers as it actually process, processes the data. Right? In some ways, you think of this generic Postgres does this. All right? So now the problem with this is that there's going to be some tasks that are going to be slower, either because the data that they're processing, it just takes longer to execute whatever the operators that they have on it. Uh, like you think of like, I have a complicated where clause where there's some predicate that is, that is really fast to compute, and, but can be very selective on some of the data. And then the remaining predicates in that, in that where clause are slow to compute. So, so 9 out of the 10 files, all the data gets filtered out by that fast predicate. So those, those tasks run really fast. But the one unlucky worker that, that, that has all the data that does satisfy the predicate then has to run the more, more expensive predicates, and then it's just going to be way slower than, than the other ones. So now all the other workers have to then wait until that task actually finishes before they can move on to, to the, the, the next pipeline for that query plan. Right? So there's, there's, there's no dynamicism in, in, the, in, in any of the decisions that we're making here. Everything's figured out ahead of time. So what Morsels is designed, designed to solve is that exact problem. How do we figure out, how do we on the fly dynamically adjust how we're executing or assigning tasks to workers so that if there's unexpected variations in the, in the, the, the runtime of tasks, uh, we can have other workers fill in and start computing things uh, rather than waiting for the, the slow straggler. So the morsels term comes from the hyper guys, because right, they were just looking for another term to mean chunk of data. They didn't want to use partition. They didn't want to use shard. Right, they didn't use, couldn't use block, because right, the, the morsel is meant to be something bigger. Right? But it, the high level, it's still the same thing. You can almost think of the same thing as, as a row group. Uh, but I think this paper came out before the row group stuff. So in their architecture, they're going to have one worker per core. They're going to turn off hyperthreading. They're going to have an assignment of one morsel per task. So task is going to be responsible for, for, for processing one morsel of, of data. They're going to do a pool based to task assignment. Right? So they're going to do this global queue that they're all going to try to pull from and figure out what to do next. And they're going to do really simple round robin data placement. Um, and so again, they keep track of what NUMA region each, each, each morsel is going to be in, and they would annotate the task to say, this task is going to execute this morsel on this morsel that's located in this NUMA region. Then each worker that can decide whether they want to you know, run a task that's, not, that's processing data that's not local to it. So they'll have all the, the, all the operators can be parallel and NUMA aware. That we can basically ignore, but it's, it's, it's can think of like having the exchange operators keep track of like, what inputs I'm waiting on before I can coalesce things and move on to the next pipeline. So this approach here, this, this Morsel paper came out in 2014, uh, and it's, it's fairly influential. Um, and this is actually what, what DuckDB does as well. And they're very upfront about this, that they basically took this paper and re-implemented it in, in DuckDB. And we had uh, Mark give a guest lecture for us uh, last year, in, in the spring semester last year, and they basically said that they're doing Morsel-driven parallelism. So again, this is not just for... for uh, for hyper, DuckDB is you know, widely used and is based on this as well. I meant to look up, I think there's a couple other systems out there that are, that are using a similar approach. All right, so in hyper, there's not going to be a single uh, a separate dispatcher thread. Every, every worker is going to be responsible for figuring out what's the next task I need to execute. Right? So you sort of think this is a like, cooperative scheduling where everyone's working together for this common cause, this global, uh, you know, th trying to achieve the, be the best performance of the system, they're working together to try to do that. But then the, the logic to figure out what's the next best thing for me to run is going to be distributed across the different workers. So I, in the ideal scenario, they're going to go look in the task queue and try to choose a task that, that again, that's going to process a morsel that's, that's local to it. If there are no local tasks that are available for the current query, uh, then they'll go find what's the next task, um, uh, what's, what's the very next task even if that data is not local to it. Because again, that's going to be able to do, uh, to, to help mitigate the issue of stragglers slowing everybody, everybody behind. 
So now, in the paper, they're going to ignore a very key problem, which I think I've already talked about, in, in their approach. And that's going to be the synchronization cost of this global hash table. It's a bit hand wavy saying it, that, it, that it's not a big deal. But then when, when we see the Umbra paper next, they basically throw it away. And they switch to a more distributed, scalable approach. And in the case of the HANA paper, which we'll cover in a, in a few minutes, they even explicitly call out the hyper approach of having this global task queue when you have a large number of, of cores is, is going to be a problem. What is the large number of cores you're uh, 32 in the paper, right? Yeah, but I think, I think it's a eight, four socket machine, right? right? Uh, I mean, for the HANA guys, they're talking like 128 sockets, if no more, larger, right? They even told me, like, they had this, like, uh, before Sigma, they would have this, like, uh, they'd invite some database faculty to come, you know, see some presentations from people working on HANA. Uh, and they had one of their customers come in, talk about how they were running on some, you know, beefy box where they were running out of address space um, in, in, X, in X64, right? Because, you know, you have 64-bit pointers, but Intel only uses 48 bits. Yeah, right. They were running out of space, uh, they were, uh, address space of 48 bits, and it was running HANA. Um, and that was a few years ago. I'm, I'm sure people are e easily exceeding that now. So, okay. All right, so again, the high-level high idea is going to be that we have some data table here, uh, and there's going to be some arbitrary uh, slicing it up horizontally into different morsels, um, and then each of these morsels will be assigned to uh, you know, one socket, one Numa region. So what does this look like, what we already talked about with PACs? Row groups. Basically the same thing, just a different name. So in there, this paper, they claim 100,000 tu 100, tuples uh, per morsel was the right amount of right size, because that, that gave them sort of the right amount of parallelism uh, in, in ac across, across all the cores. Right? If you set it too small, then you're always going to the, the task queue, and that becomes the bottleneck. If you set it too big, then you have the problem of, again, the straggler just, you know, it, it, it's the only one that can process some giant morsel, and everyone, everyone gets stalled for that. Um, when we built, uh, when we were building our system Peloton here, we did a thousand tuples per morsel, um, and then I think in the follow-up system with, with noise page, we were doing ten megabyte morsels because you could play some trick with in C++ to do twenty bit pointers, um, twenty bit offsets, and but we can ignore that. All right, so now we have our we have a query plan. We we converted it into a bunch of of tasks that we have in our task queue, and you sort of think of in the task queue again, it's the what, what the computation of the operators you want to do with the, within the pipeline, and then it's tagged with what morsels they want to operate on, right? So on each core now, they're each going to have a, uh, you know, a memory region that corresponds to the, the morsels. Again, this is just the table space for, for the tables. Then there's some local buffer they're going to use to, to write out intermediate results. Again, this is an in-memory database, so everything's all in memory here. And then you have your whatever your local, it's all in your local memory, then, then you have your, your, your single core. So, to get started, each of these guys are then going to go into the queue and pull out things that are that are going to process the data that's local to it. And then when now it runs, again, it's just it's just computing or crunching on the, the data that's local to it. So it doesn't have to go to the interconnect on the CPU. Everything can, can run really fast. And then they're always going to produce the output back into their local buffer, again, because they, they want to avoid the traffic over the interconnect or having it write it to some, so look, uh, to some remote memory. All right, so now say this, this on CPU 3, for whatever reason, it's just running slower. Um, in this case here, because there's no tasks that, that are available for this query uh, to, to execute, because the, the next stage, we have to wait for the output of, of the first stage, the first pipeline. So these guys essentially have to stall. Now, if there was another query in our, in our queue, uh, you could start processing that. But then you get in this contention of like, OK, well, I only have so much space for my buffers. Do I really want to start processing another query that, that can then interfere with the data I want to store in my, in my buffers? Because right? then I have to start swapping things in and out. Yes? These are CPUs, not cores? Or are these like individual cores? Uh, individual cores. Wait, so like, this is all in one CPU? They have their own memory? Sorry, so to be very clear. Space? One core, yeah. they have L1, L2, and then on the same socket, all the cores share, ah, share L3, and then they have local memory. Um, so I'm, I'm drawing the CPU symbol. I, I could put a thread and whatever. Like, but I think it's like one hardware core. Yep. All right, so when this guy then finishes, uh, this then frees up all the other guys 
if you then go back to the queue and pull out uh, again more you know more tasks. And again, because we the last task that they, they executed for this query wrote data to their, their local uh, buffer, uh, we want to then have the affinity of making sure that the next task that's going to process that data that we just generated in the previous pipeline is going to run on, on the same core. Right? Again, avoiding that interconnect traffic. So now in this case here, say, say this one finishes up first. So we do have actually a task we actually could execute. And so, so Hyper says that in this case here, when you do work, work stealing, it's OK for you to go across the, the NUMA region to go get the data you need, because it's better, it's better to do that than having uh, idle resources. Is there like a heuristic cost of like, because like obviously costs something to do that transition. Yes. And like you don't, like you can't ever predict like when that task on like uh, or core three is going to like finish. So like what happens if like on core three it like finishes before it's like stop, like stop operating on that part of the network? It's, so his statement is, the question is like, is there a heuristic to figure out when is it actually okay to steal? Uh, because it may be the case that right before I steal, or right, right immediately after I steal, this thing finishes, then, then, then I could have processed it, and then I could have you know, processed the data locally, and that would have been better than this guy stealing. Again, when, when it's on a single node and you're measuring things in, like, in the morsels of like 100,000 tuples, you're getting down to like milliseconds here. And it, the additional bookkeeping you would have to do to figure that out would you pay a high penalty for that? It'd be a lot of overhead to maintain that. It's just, it's just better to approximate it than just steal. Just, yeah, and then they claim it's always better to steal. In the case of HANA, they're they're going to be do do even more bookkeeping, and they say don't do any of that, and it's better to just, just uh, don't don't do any stealing because the cost is too, too high. And I'm, I guess I'm a little confused on how like stealing handles partial work. Like, partial this question work. is. Uh, how does how how can you how can it handle partial work and work stealing? Like because like presumably like core three did like an amount of work and the morsel that it's taking is it like stopping in between the like the like the morsel So so every task is one morsel. So this guy is processing you know whatever this one here. There no one's gonna, no one can take the same task because it's no longer in the queue. So when this guy when one steals the next task. It's not processing on the same data as this guy. It's completely disjoint and separate. So, there, there, so there's no concern of synchronizing about partial results. Oh, OK, I see. Yeah. It's, uh, the, the, the morsels are disjoint. Yes? So in Hyper, these, these pipelines are compiled, right? In, with DuckDB, do they, like, do they compile the pipeline? This question is, in Hyper, these are compiled pipelines. In DuckDB, do they have compiled pipelines? No. Uh, what's, what's normal? Like, like it, it, yeah, it's 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 a push-based model, but they're doing the vectorized approach of pre-compiled primitives that they uh, okay. right. Again, this is different. This like this is completely independent of the query processing model here. It doesn't matter whether it's compiled or or, or vectorized. In the back, yes. This question is: Do you do you rebalance the intermediate results? Meaning, like, oh yeah, so like if. If this guy steals a bunch of stuff and he keeps writing to their buffer, it's a, it's a local buffer, and then it's, is it going to run out of space? I don't actually don't, I don't know what they do. How do they handle that? At some point, I, I suspect you would. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how they handle it, but you, you can imagine like identifying that, oh, I, I can't, I'm running out of space. I can't process anything else. So either you don't process anything else until the query finishes, right? Or you could introduce, uh, you know, an internal task that then moves things around, but the bookkeeping for that would be too expensive. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's one of the challenges of in-memory databases is that, like you can run out of memory. Uh, I'm assuming I, I think they just assume that you don't. Yes. So the same question is: at some point you have to you have to aggregate the immediate results. Yes. But that's the exchange operator stuff we talk, saw before, right? And then in that case, that that you can't really paralyze because this one thread has, is responsible for pulling the data from all you know all the children below the exchange operator and then coalescing that to produce the final output. Okay. 
So the one of the key problems with, with Umbra, or sorry, with Hyper, is that because one worker is 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 assigned to uh, there's one yeah, because there's only one worker per core and one morsel per task, they have to do work stealing because it's almost like this uh, it's not exactly static scheduling because they are allowing things to, to, you know, to pull data as they go along, but they can't rebalance the, the amount of work that each task is doing. So in the cases where the, you know, you're blocked on waiting this last, this last task you need for this pipeline, everyone has to stall until, in, you know, until that thing finishes. Right? The other challenge, as I already said, is like they, don't really, they don't really talk about how they built their lock-free hash table. Uh, that part's a bit hand-wavy in the paper. But again, as we as we know, like that's going to be on, uh, you know always going to be a contention point. Like lock free, it doesn't mean it's magically scalable. It just means that you're never going to stall waiting for 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 you know waiting to acquire, acquire something in the lock. You may have to spin until you can acquire something though. All right, and now you're burning cycles. The other two problems they're going to have in hyper is that the they're going to treat the execution cost. Of every tuple in a morsel to be the same, uh, and, and, and as I said before, you can easily come up with examples where that may not be the case based on what the query is or what the predicates are, right? The other issue is going to be that you guys, I think, as you mentioned, in the conclusion is say, hey, it would be nice to have, you know, quality of service or priorities to keep track of these things, but they simply can't do that. It's almost a free for all. Here's whatever's in the, the, you know, in my task queue. And then, and then the, the the workers are trying to pull things as fast as possible and just, and just running it. But if I, that means I could have a I could have a, a, a long running query take up all the resources, all the workers uh, while it's processing, and then a bunch of these short queries showing up, and I have no way to easily interleave them and make sure the short queries get processed, right? And as we said, that's bad because because people are going to notice when the short run, short queries run slow. So the follow-up work to the hyper paper you guys read, or an extension to morsels, uh, is th th this paper from, from 2021 on, uh, on the new system that came after hyper called Umbra. Again, the background is that hyper uh, was built by, by Thomas and his team at, at TU Munich. They formed a little mini startup based on it. Then they got acquired by, by Tableau. And it was being used as the internal in-memory query cache for, for the Tableau, like, you know, the app, the app anytime you used it. Uh, and then Tableau got bought by Salesforce and so forth. Um, Thomas then lost control of Hyper because, you know, Tableau now owned it. So he went back and started building a new system called Umbra. Uh, and, he, and he couldn't reuse any of the source code he had from, from Hyper. Everything's written from scratch uh, because he's a freak and he can. So this is, this is a, the new scheduler that they built in Umbra that is meant to overcome the deficiencies that they had in, in the hyper morsel scheduler. So the key things are, are is that the tasks are not going to be created statically at runtime, uh, and they're not going to have the, a one-to-one -one relationship between a task and a morsel, meaning one task can process potentially multiple morsels if, if, you know, if, if it still has time available to, to compute things. right? So another way to think about this is that they're basically going to be like sort of slicing up the, the computational resource based on time. Right? Like we have this notion of quantum. So within your quantum, you can keep processing as many tuples as you can. Uh, and then when, when you run out of time, then you have to you know, give the CPU back. But I still think even though you give it back, you're still tied to the, the, I think the morsel you're processing. So nobody else can take it. The other thing they're going to be able to do to handle, um, to handle uh, you know, make sure that, that short queries aren't, aren't blocked by the longer run of queries, they're going to do automatic exponential priority decay for, for queries so that the longer a query is running in the system, the lower priority it gets over time. And so again, it'll still be scheduled eventually, but it's not going to get the, you know, it's not going to get, be, be able to execute as many resources at any given time slice as a shorter run of query who just arrived in, in the system. So at a high level, this is a, a variation of stride scheduling, which I think came out of the 80s or 90s. Do they teach that here or no? I don't think so. Or did they teach that in OS? No. OK. The, think of like it's a, um, it's a sort of a primitive way to do uh, scheduling in, in, in an operating system for you know, tasks and processes where you keep track of how long things have been running and how much work they're going to do every time they run. Um, 
But in the original implementation, like there's a global, there's a global, uh, you know, global priority list. There's global information that you have to maintain, and you assume that the workload is fixed. But obviously, in a database system, queries are coming and going all the time, and so we, we can't make that assumption. So they have ways to fix that. Yes. Exponentially growing the morph sizes, like to get like a lower bound on how long it takes to execute the query or, the ex or execute the, uh, the task. How do you know how long a task is going to execute before you execute it? You don't. So the question is, how do you know longer? How how do you know how long a task is going to take to be executed? You don't. They just turn on uh, like monitoring on it and keep track of it over time. And so when they like say exponentially growing the morsel sizes, is it like they're just adding more data to the morsel? Yes. Dynamically. Uh, or is it just giving them more morsels instead? So you think of like the morsel concept. It's just a logical concept of like here's the divider line of like where one morsel ends and stops. So like if you recognize that each task is, is computing each morsel really really fast, then you you and then, then there's more bookkeeping. You have to go back and get more. You know, give me the next task. You sort of increase what the boundary is for the morsels, so that eventually you you the the amount of work you do. So the, the amount of time it takes to process that morsel is one millisecond. Okay, so you're not changing like a given morsel after it's created. It's like for future morsels, you're going to make them bigger to better take advantage. It's the statement is you're not changing morsels after they're created. You're just making future morsels bigger. Yes, but again, the, make sure we're clear about when we say creation. It's just a logical boundary. It's not like I'm copying data and making it bigger. I'm just saying like you know, like here's how to cut things off. Yeah, yeah, I'm just saying, like, you don't go to... You don't go back to something that's already running, hey, here's 10 more tuples you didn't have before. You don't do that. Oh, yeah. no, we're actually changing this boundary, is what I was asking. Like, we're never changing the boundary for a thing that's already running. It's like we change the boundary for the like, other things that haven't been processed. Yet. For the remaining parts of the, of the data table. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So this is like there's some sort of like small size that it starts off with, and then it just keeps growing until like one of them takes longer than one millisecond. Yeah, Sam is, and he's correct, that okay. is it just that you start with a, a small size and say, okay, here's... here's for the amount of work you're going to do in a task, it's going to be the morsel, it's going to be 100,000 tuples. But then if you complete that in, a short, in less than one millisecond, then the morsel size, so the next thing you're going to process will be a little bit bigger. And you keep making it a little bit bigger until you, well, exponentially bigger until you, the, you, your task takes more than one millisecond. Yes? That might also be a bit of a non-issue, but like, do they, like, what happens if like, their starting amount is, like, takes, like, for example, like five milliseconds to execute? They're just never going to grow it anymore, but they're also going to execute. Or if it takes like a, long, like a really long amount of time because for some reason they start with really big morsel sizes. The question is, what if, what if the, what do you start with like, you know, one billion tuples per morsel and you're really big, could you shrink it? Yes. Why not? Okay, I just like, I didn't know if it was a part of like the system design because it seemed like it, it was only growing. I, yeah, but that's, that's trivial to do. Yes. Why do they want to use the, the uh, like one millisecond? Why do they want to do, why do they want to do one millisecond to run? Yeah. Because uh, it allows you to be more dynamic and not have a you know worker just not avoid the straggler problem. So they don't have to like put that into work. Uh, I think they it's it's it, it is doing work stealing, but not in the how does it 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 is doing work stealing. So it's not, it's work stealing in that there's still going to be a global queue, but they're going to be clever how they maintain it. So when I got, when I got to say, what's the next thing I want, I need to go do, I got to go consider the location of the data plus a priority of what the next thing I need to run, right? So like in, in the morsels approach, it was this morsel has to be processed by this core because that is, it's been assigned to that. And the work stealing part is I'm allowed to run tasks that are for data that, that aren't local to me. So in this one, they're doing the same thing, but they're also not including the priority information about the, you know, about the query itself. So it, it, is, it is doing work stealing. But it's, 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 it's sort of a natural, a natural is not the right word either. Uh, it just sort of just happens because of the way they're maintaining the queue. Yeah, it says, why is the goal to make it one millisecond per task? It's to balance it. Absolutely, yes. Um, is the priority like assigned before the query is executed or something like? It's, I mean, we'll see priority in a second. The question is, um, is the priority assigned when the, query, when the query starts? Yes. 
Like everyone starts with like one, and then longer you run, then that decays. In how, do you, how do you ensure that the short run was like finished well with the long run once we get power? The question is how do you make sure that the short running queries finish more quickly and the long running queries keep running? No, Could, like it seems like contradictory. If the short running one like keep, you guarantee the short running ones like finish quickly. Yes. The long running one, how can you guarantee that it does not get starved? How do you guarantee that the long run doesn't, doesn't get starved? Because the, the stride scheduling will handle that. There's this notion of a, of a, of a pass. If I haven't, um, if, if the, this sort of global counter, this watermark, it keeps ticking forward, and if my query is below that, then, I get, then I'm allowed to run again. And any new query that shows up, the shorter running queries that show up, they're going to be assigned a, a watermark that's above that global one, so that they'll, they'll be starved out. Yes? Yes. Uh, so here, if the priority is global for each worker or code, uh, the locality of data and buffer morsels isn't uh, accounted for, or is it done differently? All right. So the question is, uh, in the morsels case, bec the priority was was based on what data I, you know what data I need to access in the morsel and where am I going to write it to. Uh, what in in this case, am I not having the notion of, of locality? You do, and that that would be you would have a local priority. We'll, we'll cover that in a second. Okay, so let's first describe how they're going to avoid the, the, global, the, the, the global task queue. And so our, I mean, it still is a global task queue, but the, the state about uh, whether or not I need to refer to it to figure out what, what actually changed is we maintained in, in thread local storage at every worker. Again, assuming we're running on, on a single node. So there'll be a global task set, but all this is just a, 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 an array of pointers that tell you to go where to go find the information about the tasks that you have for a given query. And then within each worker, there's going to be these masks that keep track of uh, which, which, which slots in my, uh, my slot array up above are active, whether, and then change mask and return mask tell me whether something has changed up above and whether I should go confer it. And so what they're going to do is they're going to have their different workers across different threads are allowed to go right into the memory of these this information for the other workers as well, but they're going to be uh, do atomic compare and swap operations just to flip bits uh, or basically XORs in a single instruction. And that, you know, yes, there's cache line invalidation across interconnects, but that's not, a, it's not like you're copying a bunch of data. You're just doing one, you know, one compare and swap o over the network. So my example here, I'm going to show that we have four slots uh, in our, in, that could be active at any time. I think in the paper they talk about have 128 slots. Um, and that's just to bound how much work can be run, actively running at, at a given time. And again, the classical stride scheduling is you allow, it's, uh, it's, the number of slots is unbounded. Right? So the, again, the global, global task, slot, ta uh, task set slots, these are just pointers to where to go find the metadata uh, in memory about what these queries are actually running. All right, so let's look at an example of when a, a query finishes and when a new query arrives. Or when it, sorry, when a task set a task set finishes, right? So let's say that worker one here, he's running Q1 task set one. Worker two is running Q2 task set one. So when this thing finishes, we then need to go back up to this uh, task set slot array, follow the pointer to go look and say, okay, is there something else I should be doing for this this task set for this query? And let's say in this case here, we've completed all, we've processed all the morsels. So we know that this, this thing is done. So then now the worker thread is then responsible for then taking the next task set and we're putting that back in, in, the, in the queue, right? But now we, need, we want to notify all the workers that, hey, something has changed in this task set queue up here. So go, you know, let's go find out what it is because we want, we want them to pull it and not have to push it, right? Because if, if you start pushing things, you have to maintain latches to make sure that you're not, not overwriting information uh, inappropriately. So all we need to do now is just update the, in this return mask. We just do a compare and swap at each, each thread to now say set a one to this slot. And then next time the, the worker comes back around and says, okay, I need to go get, you know, I need to do something, you know, I need, I need another task to, you know, to compute on, 
it knows that it needs to go check the, the task queue to find out new information that somebody posted about it. It's like, a, it's like a message board saying, like, hey, by the way, here's a change. I'm not telling you what it is. Or it's like a new email notification. I'm not telling you what it is, here, but you know where to go, go look for that information. All right, so now let's say Q3 shows up, query three. So it ends up getting put into the global task slot in this position here. And again, some other thread, like a scheduled thread or a coordinated thread, is responsible for then flipping a bit in the change mask for all these, uh, you know, for all these threads and say, hey, by the way, there's a new, new query just showed up in this slot. And the distinction between the return mask and the change mask is because there's some bookkeeping reason that you have to do this. Yes? Well, I don't understand. I thought there was no dispatcher thread. It's not a dispatcher thread like, hey, here's this task. More like there's, a, there's something up above that takes the, the query that shows up, right? Okay. And somebody's got to then put that in, in, the, in, the, in the queue. So whatever that is, okay. right? So you could call that the coordinator or, or, the, or a scheduler thread, okay. right? But it, whatever that thread is, not, it's not responsible for saying, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. They're all pooling with themselves. But you, you just need something to flip a bit and say, by the way, like, we, we added something new. Make sure you go check it out. In the back, yes. Is the question is, would, would, the, would the dispatcher be responsible for flipping the bits in the return mask? No. As far as I know, the, the thread that was responsible for putting the data that, 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 that computed the result mm -hmm. is responsible for flipping the bits on everyone. His question is, why not let the dispatcher handle that? Because now you got to go tell the dispatcher to go do it. It's just cheaper to go do it yourself. I still don't understand why we're not doing push instead of pull over here. His question, why, his question is, why aren't we doing push versus pull? Because when, you're, when the worker is trying to pull from the global task set slots, right, it, it, there is locking, yes. Which, OK, sure, we can't get rid of that. But it's wasting cycle to go and ask and look into the global task set slots there. Hey, what do I need to do? And if there is already a thread that's running and changing the you know the bits, it might as well keep track of what each worker is doing, and then tell it to do some stuff. So his statement is: uh, if something's already responsible for putting things in the global task queue, yeah. why not just have that thing responsible for telling people what to do? Yes. Um, but then again, you, then you got to maintain that. Like you have, to, you have to maintain the state somewhere. And they're arguing that it's better to distribute it across the different workers in TLS and have that be, and then to do simple compare and swaps to maintain, you know, to, to notify them that the changes that are occurring rather than having a more heavyweight approach of like, you know, farming out complex messages that they need to process themselves. It's cooperative scheduling. So rather than having one thread be responsible for everything, like, and in potentially that could be more efficient to do like a, with a small number of cores, but this approach is definitely more scalable for a larger number of cores. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, right. So then this thing knows that it when, when it finishes the, the, the task it was running, goes back up, looks in the queue, decides that you know for whatever, whatever reason that that you know will get the information looking at the change mask and return mask. What needs to update? It updates its active slot now to say, hey, there's something in one I could go take. And then it decides to run Q3 task at one. And notice here now on uh, worker two, it doesn't know about the Q3, Q3 yet. It just knows that a bit got flipped in the first slot. And eventually, when I go back and look at the task set uh, queue, I'll go learn what that is. So these things can run independently of each other without having to coordinate across all of them, which is arguably always going to be better. All right, so um, we only have a few minutes. I'll skip the priority delay, but basically think about it as like the, there's, this, um, there's this notion of, of the, this global pass. Just think of the, the, the number of times I, I, I've passed through or I've executed things. And then I have priorities about individual queries. I have local priorities based on how much work I've done for this query. And the combination of these things then determines what you want to run. But idea, again, the high-level idea is that as a query runs longer, the, this priority decays and goes down. All right, so I'm going to quickly zoom through uh, HANA. Again, this is just a, this is the other end extreme of complexity. So think of like Postgres is the easiest one. You just say, let the OS do it, right? Uh, the HANA approach here, which again, I think it was a PhD dissertation at, as somebody um, that, worked, that worked at SAP, 
So I don't think this ever actually made it in the real HANA system, especially if they, they rewrote it uh, in, the, in the late 2010s. Um, but it, it just the idea is that, like again, of how to just have the data system do even more scheduling on its own for individual threads, and not let the OS do do any of that. So this is going to this is going to support both workload stealing and and pool scaling, meaning within a single on a single socket or a single NUMA region, I can add more threads dynamically and not have this the limitation of having one thread per per you know CPU core. I can add, start adding more and more cores if I think uh, things are going to get stalled on doing, you know, for, for a variety of reasons. And then they're going to have this notion of a, uh, a two different kind of queues of work. They're going to have a soft queue and a hard queue. A hard queue is going to be tasks that you don't want anybody to steal that has to run in that socket or that NUMA region. Um, so think of something like garbage collection for data that's in, that's in that NUMA region. You don't want to have that go with the interconnect or like a, a networking task that has to run on, on, a, on a given socket. But the soft queue will be things that workers are not allowed to steal, similar to the hyper approach when you're doing scans. So I've already said this, we're going to have the soft and hard priority queues, but then they're going to have different, four different worker pools uh, of threads. So you have worker threads that are actively running something, inactive ones that are blocked in the kernel waiting for some kind of conditional, uh, conditional lock or uh, conditional variable or latch. Then you have ones that are free that I wake up a little bit, check to see if there's anything to do. And then you have a, a parked um, threads where you've actually descheduled them and you hand them back to the OS kernel, like a, like a, like a, like a sleep or a yield. And they, they're just sitting down there. And then if you need them, you can spin them up. And the argument here is that it's cheaper to, to go put some threads down in the scheduler in the OS and let them to sleep down there uh, so that when I need them, I, I, can, I can pick them up and start running with them compared to having to spin up a whole process or spin up a whole thread if I all of a sudden I, I need more of that. So let me, again, let me skip this real quickly. Basic idea works the same thing as before, that we have a bunch of stuff we want to execute for a query, but now I'm including some, some maintenance tasks like garbage collection for a multi version concurrent control, because HANA was an MVCC system. So these queries here, they have to run, uh, you know, they, they, you need to run right now, but they can go in the soft queue because, again, and technically any new socket and any, any region can run them. Um, but then the, the GCC stuff, say we'll put that in the hard queue. And then the working threads are going to be responsible for executing the, these active tasks. And then for the inactive ones, again, these are things that haven't, uh, that are, that are inactive is blocked on something that, uh, like in the kernels, that we can't, we can't actually start executing them, but we expect them to wake up fairly soon. Free is going to be one that is spinning all the time looking for work to do. And the parked are the ones that are heavyweight uh, paused down in the kernel. So again, the free ones are allowed to pull this all the time, and to find something, then it's allowed to execute it. So the, the HANA guys are going to claim that in their experimentation with this approach, that they, it was better for the, for the large, large socket machines to turn off all the work stealing. So you basically don't put everything always in the hard queue. And that was always better than uh, you know, moving things across different, different NUMA regions. I would argue that I think the, the, I like this. I like having all this stuff manage yourself instead of the OS doing it. Um, and so for the inactive ones, again, for, for its OLAP, this, maybe this is less of an issue. But if an OTP system, this, this makes sense. And Han was trying to support both OLAP and OTP. So it made sense to have this sort of different variations in threading. All right, I'm running through this really fast. I want to show you one last thing about uh, in SQL Server because to me this is uh, this is relevant for how you design systems. What? Is huh? this an OS like it's designed for, for databases? SQL OS? Yeah. Uh, SQL. All right, so let me get the back up. It's not it's not a full operating system, right? right. Um, so SQL OS is an abstraction layer in SQL Server that they built in 2006 that hides the low level details of hardware and the, the operating system from the upper parts of the, the, the database system. And the reason why they built this is that Microsoft observed that every time new hardware was coming out, they had to rewrite all their operating implementations to account for whatever the hardware was. Like you had much more cores, they had to rewrite a bunch of stuff. They had a new regions, they had to rewrite re re a bunch of stuff. And so this abstraction layer allows them to hide those low level details. And the scheduling and the, and the, and the movement of, of, of data can all be managed by this SQL OSing. So it's not a full operating system, 
like like the Linux kernel or or Windows or HBox or whatever, right? It's just it's sort of an abstraction layer. But the cool thing that they're going to do is going to do non-preemptive thread scheduling inside the database system. What's another word for non-preemptive thread scheduling? Coroutines. Same idea, right? Where you have the you have a thread that uh, you're, you're managing threading, multi-threading within within the database system itself. But since since it's not preemptive, like preemptive means the OS can go steal you, take and take the you know take your hardware thread and give it to someone else. It's we're all running all these threads are running within the database system itself, so we can't do that. We can't send an interrupt to ourselves like that, right? So that means that in our code itself, we're going to have to go put explicit instructions to yield back to the scheduler to say, hey, by the way, go check to see whether something else could be running instead of me. I and mean, they did this um, back in 2006, before C++ loss and, and Go and other programming languages now have you know, built-in support for coroutines. So there's a great article here at how they built it. Um, I used to say that SQL OS allowed Microsoft to make it, uh, to, to get SQL Server to run on, on Linux. Uh, and because I, I, again, it abstracted, the, the, it abstracted the, the OS layer. The guy that built SQL OS then called me and said that's not true. Actually, their attempt to kind of get SQL Server running in Docker turned out to be what got them to, to be able to support it. But this is a good, good article that talks about it. Again, real quick, let me just show you what it looks like. So you have some SQL query like this. They're going to set their quantum to four, four milliseconds. So, so say you want to do a sequential scan of this data. Again, a proximal query plan would look like this. Eval a predicate, admit it. What they're literally going to do is keep track of the time uh, different parts of, of, of the operator while they run, and they check to see whether the, the elapsed time since they started running is greater than the quantum for milliseconds. If yes, they yield back. Now, I mean, this is pseudocode. You would not want to do this. this is like, you, you don't, going checking the system clock is expensive. Don't do that. Right? There's, there's, there's hardware instructions to hide that for you. But basically, again, if I, if, I, if I know I'm running longer than I need to, I'll go yield. You can do this for other things in your data system too. Like if, if you're going to go try to acquire a lock, the lock's not available. Instead of your thread spinning and waiting to try to acquire that lock, you yield back. But again, because the data system controls everything, we yield back with not just like, you know, if you yield to the OS, what do you say? Yield. That's it. In the database system, we can say, I'm yielding back to the scheduler, and oh, by the way, I need this lock. Don't schedule me until that lock is now available. And then when it does, the OS can, can put you back. Right? So we can have complete control of everything if we do this ourselves. So SQL OS is probably the first one that did this. There's other systems that do this now. ScaliaDB does, has this framework called CSTAR. FaunaDB does a poor man's version of this. Basically, every time before they read something from disk, they just yield. And that's it. Right? And then Corabase is an experimental system out of Simon Fraser University that explicitly does uh, built entire coroutines. And there's a, there's a video from the ScaliaDB guys from a few years ago that talks about their, their CSTAR thing. OK, we're well over time. Um, Distributed scheduling, basically all the same problems, but now we're over the network. Right? No, <laughs> I mean, you laugh. That's really what it is. Uh, and then we'll cover workload stealing, dynamic scaling later. But we'll see this Snowflake can do both. Some systems can do ones versus the other. All right. Main takeaway. Database systems are beautiful. Don't let the operating system tell you, boss you around. Don't let the operating system try to do anything. We want to do everything ourselves. I think the SQL OS approach is probably the right way to do it. I think it's an overkill for what we're doing in this class. But but, you know, it's beautiful. Okay. What's that? Strong will, too, yes. Next class, we'll do nothing but hash joins. Uh, and then on Monday next week, we'll do multi way joins. We'll do a quick uh, overview of performance counters that we talked about, that somebody had a question about. We'll do that next week on Monday. And then Wednesday next week will be the, the project status updates, okay? Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't it no puzzle, I guzzle, cause I'm more a man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw about three in the freezer so I can chill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, oops, don't spill it. Cause St. Isles is said, the pain I wet. You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head. Take back the pack of duds. You go get you some St. Isles and drink it to the studs. Billy D is the silly cheese, so down with the weak guys. Be a man to get a can of snake eyes.